Good morning, everyone. My name is Sam Lang, and today I will be presenting the final briefing for the Climate Stewardship Act. Before I get started, I'd like to thank my team, uh, Jasmine, Nikki, and Mia, as well as the rest of our group for all of their hard work throughout the semester, and Dr. Palmer for all of his help. Our nation's farms, forests, and wetlands are suffering from mismanagement and the impacts of climate change. Our country faces reduced crop yields, catastrophic fires, worsening coastal flooding, and all of these produce carbon emissions, which then exacerbate the problems occurring within each ecosystem. The photo on the left is of a farm outside of Los Angeles that was farmed extractively for 50 years. It was a monoculture farm that used agricultural practices ill-suited for the environment, and the soil was almost completely unproductive for farming without huge amounts of fertilizer. This is one of the many farms in the United States that has deteriorated their soils and the environment with certain agricultural management practices. This is a photo of the King Fire, which in 2014 burned 100,000 acres of the El Dorado National Forest in California. Decades of mismanaged forest fires in California, particularly through fire suppression, led to a buildup of vegetation, which now under hotter, drier conditions, acts as fuel for fire and release, releases huge amounts of carbon and burn. This combination of anthropogenic factors and a changing climate have led to these massive forest fires that we've seen out west for the last decade or so. Wetlands have the capacity to store vast amounts of carbon and to buffer coastal communities from climate change effects, such as storm surges and flooding. But due to the poor management and the effects of climate change, wetlands are storing less carbon, emitting carbon at higher than natural rates, and are ineffectively buffering coastal communities from these floods. In summary, the way we manage these systems in the US has shifted what were once resilient carbon sinks to be net carbon emitters, thus contributing to climate change. When people think about climate change, they tend to think of tailpipes and smokestacks, but these natural systems play a role as well. In response to these issues, the Climate Stewardship Act presents innovative environmental and economic measures that restore these ecosystems and their carbon sequestering abilities, um, aim to mitigate climate change and improve climate resilience, as well as promote social equity. The Climate Stewardship Act addresses these issues in three titles, each one focused on one of the land uses. Title I starts with agriculture. Title I expands existing programs and creates new programs by providing funding that scales up every year until 2030. The total funding increase will equate to tens of billions of dollars and will help provide incentives, technical assistance, and assist farmers in purchasing equipment in order to further these climate stewardship goals. The title defines 38 specific climate stewardship practices with climate resilience and mitigation as a focus for each. The bill also expands a lot of land acreage and program life for existing agricultural programs and reserves 5% of funding for low income and minority producers, as well as first time farmers. Um, the bill supports practices like these listed on the screen that meet their definition of climate stewardship, which is any effective vegetative or management practice that reduces greenhouse gas emissions, increases carbon sequestration, or assists producers in adapting to or mitigating against the effects of climate change. Let's look at a case study to see how this can be applied in farmland. So if you remember that first photo of the lifeless soil that was unproductive for agriculture, this is what that same farm looks like after the incorporation of climate stewardship practices. So these photos are from Apricot Lane Farm, an example of a farm that has built up resilience to increase drought conditions and climatic changes. You may recognize this if you've ever seen the Hulu documentary, Biggest Little Farm. Apricot Lane uses many of the climate stewardship practices listed in the bill, including crop rotation, grazing rotation, pollinator habitat establishment, compost application, and cover cropping. These practices work to store carbon in the soil, increase nutrient and water content, and grow 200 varieties of fruits and vegetables. Some things to consider moving forward is that these results may not replicate the same everywhere due to climatic variations, and the types and number of practices implemented can yield different outcomes. So the goal here would be to use intentional localized planning with federal assistance when carrying out these climate stewardship practices within agriculture. Title II covers forestry. Um, so Title II focuses on reforestation in order to increase carbon sequestration and decrease emissions from forests. To achieve these goals, the Climate Stewardship Act proposes major increases in funding. The Reforestation Trust Fund will go from $30 million of funding to $5.5 billion, which is over an 18,000% increase. And this will fund reforestation work across the United States. Reforestation under this act will take place on both private and public forests, 
including federal, state, tribal, and municipal land, and will take place on both urban and rural landscapes. The act also outlines the creation of the Conservation Stewardship Board, which will provide employment within forest management for young people from low-income communities, indigenous communities, and communities of color. The act includes tree planting goals that scale up yearly and equate to 1.7 billion trees planted by 2030. Though most of these will be planted in remote forests, 100 million of them are set to be planted in urban areas, specifically areas that have traditionally been redlined. Reforestation techniques will be backed by climate science and will aim to diversify forests in order to increase resilience and carbon sequestration and will also reduce ero soil erosion in order to promote long-term carbon storage. Currently, there are varying studies of sequestration potential, as sequestration in forests depends on many factors, including tree size and biodiversity. So these factors will have to be taken into consideration when planning reforestation efforts moving forward. So if you recall, I mentioned the King Fire from 2014, but informed by new applied science, climate science, reforestation efforts are now focused on improving forest resilience and long-term sequestration. Since the fire, um, thousands of trees have been planted in order to test out a climate resilient design. Specifically, they're using cluster planting where trees are planted in groups close to water sources in order to better stand up to drought. And also this, also this way, fire cannot as easily spread among the trees. Um, so this is basically to mimic what the forest would look like if we had used prescribed burns as opposed to fire suppression. And is one example of how we can plan out our reforestation practices moving forward. Last, we'll cover wetlands. So the Climate Stewardship Act establishes the Coastal and Estuary Resilience Grant Program to provide funding for coastal wetland restoration. At present, federal funding for wetland restoration is largely distributed by, by the NOAA National Coastal Resilience Grant Program, which offered $34 million of funding in 2021. The Coastal Estuary Resilience Grant Program allocates $37.5 billion through 2030. This is an average of $4.2 billion per year, which is over a 12,000% increase in annual funding. The Act also provides technical assistance and sets ambitious targets for restoration. It sets out to restore 2.3 billion acres by 2030, um, which is a 13,000% increase from the almost 18,000 acres, which have been restored by previous federal restoration initiatives. Significantly, this program also prioritizes funding projects that are led by historically marginalized leaders in frontline communities. Wetland mismanagement has resulted in increased climate risks, such as flooding events for surrounding communities, as well as increased carbon emissions from wetlands, when in reality, wetlands can act as very powerful carbon sinks. Um, wetland restoration practices encouraged by the bill may include revegetation, hydraulic correction, and thin layer sediment placement, all of which improve sediment structure and water dynamics within the wetlands. This Florida Bay mangrove was highly degraded, resulting in mass vegetation losses and resulting erosion. You can see here that the water is really cloudy. This is due to all of the suspended sediment, which should be still attached to the wetland wall. With restoration efforts, the roots of the wetland plants can help increase secretion, which is the buildup of sediment and soil over time um, by trapping and holding the sediments in place while simultaneously slowing tidal currents by absor absorbing wave impacts, thereby reducing erosion. This was observed in a 2017 study of wetland revegetation and accretion in Tampa Bay, Florida, where a revegetating coastline with mangrove increased sediment accumulation from 1.5 to 7.2 millimeters per year to 4.2 to 11 millimeters per year. With a sea level rise in that area of 2.6 millimeters per year, revegetation significantly increases the elevation relative to the waterline, reducing the threat of wetland loss to sea level rise. So success in this bill in general will just mean more carbon sequestration and lower emissions from these three land systems. Um, these will be evaluated through some common methods like studying the soil carbon with the soil cores, but there are also some system specific measurements. So while we'll look at soil carbon across all three, within forestry, we will also look at tree cover and within wetlands, we will also look at accretion. So in conclusion, the Climate Stewardship Act presents innovative environmental and economic measures that restore these ecosystems, promote social equity, and engage Americans in climate resilience work. If we can optimize functions within farms, forests, and wetlands, we can ensure each ecosystem's ability to support life and use them as nature-based carbon sequestration mechanisms in the fight against climate change. Thank you all for listening, and with that, I would be happy to take any questions. Right here. Fantastic. Uh, uh, 
Um, so anytime you introduce nature into the equation, there's a lot of variables you have to consider, right? And given the speed that we have to sequester carbon, are you how confident are you that this is the best use of our resources? Like our time or our time, money, people, you know, really anything that we would have to throw with this that couldn't be allocated. Yeah, so I think this is a very effective use of our resources. Um, for one thing, these systems already exist. We already have agriculture. We already are meeting deforestation efforts. So to just do so more efficiently and with climate variations in mind, I think is an extremely efficient resource. Additionally, these practices aim to do more than just sequester carbon. They aim to stop forest fires and floods, all of which are incredibly expensive in terms of damages and can be really devastating to communities. So overall, I think. It is a very efficient use of our resources. Other questions? For your presentation, I was just curious from your research of looking at the three and um, one of them like, seems to have a lot more potential in carbon sequestration than other ones. Or um, I think it kind of depends on the way that you're looking at it. So, for instance, while wetlands can store a lot of carbon within their soil, they do cover less land area as opposed to forests, which may have slightly less storage potential within the soil, but do just cover a greater space of the country. So, it kind of depends on a bunch of different factors. Great presentation, Sam. I really love that. Um, so, in terms of um, the, the portion of the bill that provides funding to the farmers to um, to more sustainable agricultural practices, I was curious if there are any um, incentives or methods of promoting that component of the bill, or is it just kind of like a pure cost of offering to the farmers that um, they have to request that funding? Um, it's kind of just a cost recovery thing, but at the same time, it's that farmers are now given financial assistance and incentives to incorporate these practices and also a lot of farmers do see a lot more promising results using these practices so in that example that we use that farm became significantly more productive after implementing these policies so it's kind of twofold right it's that the farm can have healthier soil which can lead to greater crop use but for uh, crop production while they also have that financial assistance from the government there's one more Forest restoration takes more than decades to overcome. So, how do we ensure there's long-term funding and that there's something happen that requires more funding that we ensure the Yeah, so the funding does scale up um, significantly until I believe about 2030. Um, so that kind of ensures that there will be these goals that are long-term um, beyond the scope of the bill. I can't really speak to what the government's going to do, um, but hopefully, if these forests do prove to be successful in Forest fires and emissions, then there will be additional funding to follow.